All right, it is about eight o'clock. We're gonna get started. Um, I wanna thank everyone for coming to our last video of our e-lecture series. Um, we have a very special speaker today, um, but first a little bit of housekeeping. A reminder, this video uh, and all the videos on the e-lecture series are for educational purposes only. All of the interactive features have been disabled for attendees to ensure optimal quality. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you won't have any interactive features to ask questions such as chat. So as before, if you can email us at emerymskradiology at gmail.com. Um, the speaker today has agreed to do a Q&A. So again, um, if you can email your questions, we will be able to get to them at the end. Um, Dr. Peterson has agreed to allow for recording. So we will record this video and upload it to the YouTube channel either today or tomorrow. A reminder, attendees have not been given permission to screen record any of these talks, which may contain material under copyright unauthorized recording, use, distribution, and sale of this material for, uh, without permission from the speaker is illegal. Uh, with that, I'm gonna introduce our speaker today. Um, today we have Dr. Ryan Peterson, who is an assistant professor of radiology at Emory University, who works in the section of neuroradiology with a dual appointment in the Department of Emergency Medicine. He serves as the program director for the uh, radiology residency clinical educator tract and the preliminary radiology internship. He is also Associate Program Director of the Radiology Residency and the Clinical Site Director for Neuroradiology at Grady Memorial Hospital. Dr. Peterson did his residency and his fellowship in neuroradiology at Emory. He serves on many institutional, national, and international committees and is a powerhouse in the radiology educational realm. He has been a frequently invited guest lecturer at various residency programs across the country to not only speak about neuroradiology, but also how he leverages his social media skills to extend his teaching reach. Dr. Peterson is well known for his radiology unknown case of the day feed on Twitter, where he's approaching 6,000 followers and has had over 2 million impressions. His cases and teaching points are fantastic, just like his lectures. It is a privilege to have Dr. Peterson with us today. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Peterson. Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, it is my pleasure to be here. Now, this is a, a topic that uh, I find very hard, and this is what my residents fear the most on call. So we'll go through some of this, and hopefully we'll help you um, in your daily practice. Um, let's make sure. Can you all see the screen okay? I think so. Hold on. It was up. We just lost it. Okay. There you go. All right. So I have no disclosures. And so today we're going to review some basics of uh, imaging. Um, some spine anatomy. We're going to talk about this AO spine classification system that a lot of institutions are using, including the uh, ASNR. And then we're gonna, I'm going to show you some cases. Uh, I'm going to sometimes feel like we're moving fast, but that's just to cover uh, a lot of topics. So there should be some indi imaging indications that you're using um, when you're doing Im um, imaging of the spine, whether that's the nexus or Canadian C-spine rule. And I'm not going to go through these, but these are just basic criteria. When you're talking about the Canadian C-spine rule, this has to do more with age and mechanism. But again, when you're doing mostly C-spine imaging with CT or X-ray, you should have some sort of clear imaging indications. Now, ACR appropriateness says that you can do an MRI if there is a myelopathy or other neurologic deficit, even if there's nothing on the CT scan. Um, if there's imaging suggestive of a lig ligamentous injury, if they can't evaluate the patient clinically um, for 48 hours, say they're intubated and they just can't uh, be evaluated, or for surgical planning. So we, we've sort of had a flux in some of these MRI sequences, but these are the basic sequences. Um, T1, T2, and fat sat or stir uh, sagittal images. Um, the fluid sensitive sequences are my favorite to use or, or my workhorse. A sagittal GRE, and that's for looking at cord hemorrhage. And then your axial T2s, we usually use a spin echo and a GRE. And then we have started using these thin section T2 space um, Fiesta, whatever you're, you're calling it, with the reformats. <clears throat> now, when you're reviewing an MRI, the, the, if you don't remember anything from today, it's always review the CT images first. And the, you're going to pay attention to subtle end plate fractures or malalignment. That's the thing that my residents will miss the most on call, is the subtleness to some of the malalignments, okay? 
then you're going to try to look for imaging characteristics of injury. That's mostly on those stirs, looking for abnormal signal architecture, something that's abnormal on those uh, fluid sensitive sequences. And then try to figure out what the mechaniz mechanism of injury is, whether it's a flexion ex or extension, or if it's a rotational in injury type of process. So once you get those in your head, you can sort of help define uh, and find some of the ligaments that are injury. And then after that, sort of you want to look for things that will lead to secondary injury, being epidural hematomas, blunt cerebral vascular injury, um, something that's unstable that might cause additional core damage, or something that's hitting the brainstem that's going to cause respiratory failure. So I don't, this is just a, you can either do a top down process and then go front to back, but whatever it is, just do it the same way every single time. And that's just sort of a process you need to come up with. Now we're gonna look at some anatomy. So sometimes when I teach this to the residents, they sort of look at me like this, or uh, they just tell me this. And it's hard sometimes when the patient's moving around, if they're not intubated, they're not uh, sedated, it gets really hard to see some of these structures. You really have to have uh, good imaging and a good patient. So when we start talking about the cranial cervical junction, there's two major joints. There's lano-occipital and lano-axial. And the main goal of this joint is to protect the spinal cord, but allow mobility, okay? So with the lano-occipital, it's mostly flexion extension. Those occipital condyles glide on the sockets of the atlas. But then the lano-axial is really involved in that uh, axial rotation, okay? Now, I've gone through many MRIs to try to find this anatomy, and you're not going to see this anatomy on every single case, okay? So just real quick, just we're on the same page. This is your tympanic membrane. It comes from the dorsum of the, the clivus and comes along the back side of your dens. You have your ALL. It sort of has a flat, uh, like a fan shape coming from the clivus, comes down to that anterior arch of C1, and then comes on down along the anterior portion of the vertebral bodies. Don't make sure you're not looking at the posterior pharyngeal wall and thinking that that's the LL. It's, it's gonna should be right up against the bones right here uh, on the vertebral bodies. And then you have your posterior atlano-occipital membrane that goes from the occiput back to the posterior arch of C1. Um, again, if you're looking, you the, ap the apical ligament should go from the tip of the dens uh, to the tip of the clivus, okay? The anterior lano-occipital membrane should go from the clivus to the anterior arch of C1. And then remember your PLL is sort of just a continuation of that tympanic membrane down. Now there's some other weird ligaments that don't do anything that are not, are not gonna hold your head to your spine, Mark, namely the Barco's lig ligament, okay? Um, and then your uh, transverse occipital ligament. And those, and I'll give you another picture of that real quick, but the, the barcos is supposed to go sort of just anterior to the dens. Um, and there you go. Here's an axial image. And you can see there's that barcos ligament. I try to uh, show my fellows that every once in a while, but it's going right anterior to that tip of the dens and that transverse ligament starting sort of, it's a little, that's dorsal to the dens. So, now, as you come down a little bit further, you have the dens, and this is like the main workhorse of keeping your, your spine together at that uh, C1, C2 junction, is that transverse ligament. Remember that transverse ligament is part of like the cruciate ligament. Uh, it's that thick fibrous band. Remember there's this longitudinal um, part of the cruciate or the cross, um, really doesn't have, it sort of folds into the tympanic membrane doesn't really um, have that much stability, but the transverse ligament does. And then the other thing, this is a coronal view, the main sort of stabilizer is this alar ligament. It goes from the tip of the dens uh, to the occipital condyle. And you can see on this coronal view, you're starting to get part of that, um, that C1 ring uh, the, of the transverse ligament right here and here around the dens. Okay. Just some other normal anatomy you should be looking at alignment, making sure that things are all lined up. But also, as one of our radiologists here at uh, Emory used to say, is these shingles on a roof, all these facets should be lying on top of each other. There shouldn't be much signal around them. Um, when you're young and don't have degenerative spine, you can see a little slip of fluid there, uh, but you're, you shouldn't have too much sing signal on those uh, facets. Okay. And then I always talk about this normal, the supraodontoid space. So the part of the space above the uh, dens here. 
you can still have a little bit of T2 signal up there um, on these fluid sensitive sequences. Um, but this is an example. This is a fluidly abnormal um, superodontoid signal, just all fluid here. Now there's definitely like a, a, a continuum between those two. So it's just looking and seeing uh, if what kind of pathology you see on CT as well. So it's just some basics of anatomy, okay? Now, what is AO spine? It's this big long German association that I don't know how to say because I don't speak German, but basically it's a morphology-based classification system for spine trauma. Um, they couple clinical factors related to what we're seeing on imaging. And this is just a society that's come up with a way to report and describe that. And I'm gonna use that as a basis for what I talk about today. Now, when you're reporting AO spine, it's even gone into our Society of Neuroradiology, where you can actually download um, these report templates uh, for common, uh, like common terminology. And this is just an example from what we have as an impression in our system here at Grady that we're trying to use more and more often. So with AO, it's classified into three different levels. There's the upper cervical spine, that's like the cranial cervical junction down to like C3, subaxial, which is cervical spine, which is from C3 down, and then thoracal lumbar. And then there's three different sort of grades. So whether it's just osseous, whether it's ligamentous injury without translation, or whether it's translated, whether things have started to move. So it's really simple, it's really basic, but it's a, it's a great way to sort of characterize your uh, spine pathology. Now, when we start talking about osseous injury, I like to say that CT is superior for fractures. I mean, uh, sometimes uh, you can miss, uh, if it's too early, you can miss that edema, uh, but always, like I said, use your CT. Now, when you're looking at MR, you're either looking for disruption of that dark T2 cortex or you're just looking for an extent of edema um, or looking for any edema in those occult fractures. That's what you're looking for for osseous injuries. But sometimes it's hard to see. This is more for, MRI is more for ligaments. So when we start talking about the upper cervical trauma, this is divided into three categories, whether it's the occipital condyle cranial cervical junction, the C1, C2 ring sort of transverse ligament level, or at C2, C3, okay? So when we start talking about those different categories, um, type A is usually just the occipital condyle. Type B would be that like a, what's happening to the ALR ligament. And type C is the cranial cervical junction, like a, a cranial cervical dissociation. And I'll show you some cases of that. So here is a couple examples of a type, uh, different types of occipital condyle fractures. And I always like to pimp my resins on these, but you can see this type one is more of a crush injury. And that's sort of like, head a diving injury or the patient's flying through the um, the windshield and you can see it's it's bone on bone it's that those occipital condyles are mashing on the uh, lateral masses c1s there type twos is the drunk person that falls back hits the back of their head they get a calvarial fracture but the fracture extends into the occipital condyle that would be a type two those are mostly stable Type three is the unstable, the, the one that we don't wanna miss. And sometimes it's hard to tell between type three and type one, at least I think so. Um, this would be looking at axial and coronal views. You can see this is the avulsion fracture. That's where that alar ligament has been ripped right off, ripped that piece of bone off of the occipital condyle. And those are the quote, unstable type fractures. Now, when you're looking at the ALR ligament, I love to use the coronal views, but you know, I don't see that much disruption of these. This is a very strong ligament. This is from the literature. I had to go back and get it. And this is using a T1 weighted sequence. And I think this is showing some blood here and disruption of that ALR ligament. But if you're going to be looking for the ALR ligament, use your coronal views. And I'll give you a couple more examples today. And when we're talking about type C injuries at this level, this would be the cranial cervical dissociation. You can see that this occipital condyle is not in the cup here. It's distant. And on the coronal views, you can see that widening of that joint space there. This is a case, uh, this is the MRI for that case. And you can see that the, that's that weird superodontoid signal. They've disrupted ALL, all of their apical bark, like all of those ligaments, even the tectoral membrane has been disrupted right here. And you can see that there's fluid in that joint space and there's been distraction of that. These are the patients that have clothesline injuries. 
Um, they uh, motorcyclists that get their chin uh, stuck when they go underneath a car or a vehicle or other uh, structure, and they get their chin caught and it gets pulled up. This is a case we had pretty recently, and I threw this in here because you can see this uh, dissociation here. But when you look at this, there's a whole lot of edema here, and everything is just sort of torn and moved, and um, you don't know what's going on in the CT. And this person didn't survive, so we didn't get an MRI on them, but they actually had a, um, this is a CTA, and they had a contrast extravasation so bad in the subarachnoid spaces, it starts to act like a ventriculogram and a myelogram because there's so much contrast getting into the subarachnoid space. You can see here's the optic apparatus right there. And as you come down, they've totally torn the fecal sac, and that's what's in the prevertebral soft tissues. It looks like a myelogram uh, because there's so much contrast there, but we'll show you that case later, but that's just a consequence of that. So C1, C, the next level is the C1, C2 uh, sort of joint space, and that would be sort of our Jefferson type fractures or the uh, transverse process fractures. That would be type A, just osseous. But when you start looking at the ligaments, main player is gonna be your transverse ligament here. Um, and then the type C injuries are gonna be those rotatory subluxation type injuries. So when you talk about just uh, these C1 fractures or Jefferson fractures, these are again, diving injuries, axial loading type injuries. And you can see it's gonna break the ring at multiple points usually. Um, this is a type B injury. Um, I'm not gonna show you the, oh, I'll show you the MRI in a second, but I don't need an MRI to tell me that this transverse ligament is damaged. You can see this is a coronal view. You have your lateral masses of C1 and they're starting to slip off of the lateral masses of C2. And you have these avulsion type fractures here. I mean, you don't need me to an MRI to tell you that. You can also see that crush injury uh, of C2 there. Um, here's another example. You can see that there's an avulsion fracture. There's a fragment here of some sort and these lateral masses are slipping off. So make sure that you're using your uh, CT first to look at that. And you can see here, this T2, this uh, T2 weighted sequence, you can see the transverse ligament here is nice, but then it's completely disrupted on that left side. And that's why things are slipping away because it's fractured and things are just sloughing off. And then um, these are some type C injuries where you actually have C1 and C2 lifting off of each other. You have your lanodensa interval. And remember for uh, kids, it's uh, five millimeters and adults, it's three. But you can see that some, the transverse ligament is not holding that dens in the right place. So you know that it's a translational type injury. And this person actually had, uh, was brain dead because of the vascular in, in, injury associated with it. Now I find so, rotatory subluxation extremely hard. We don't see it that often because these patients don't do very well. And it's a lot of clinical um, sort of uh, indicate like clinical feedback to tell you whether this person really does have a rotatory subluxation because, or if their neck is just turned because that's the way the tech put it that way. But here you can see that the C1 arch is pointing in this direction, but C2 is pointing in this direction. That's something you can think about. But I took this one from the literature. You can see the den, if you start seeing the den sort of displaced to one side or another, and you see on the coronal view that like everything is shifting one way, like C1 is shifting one way in regards to C2, that's when you wanna start thinking about rotatory subluxation. Now I will say in younger individuals that you can have a little bit of asymmetry in this space between C1 and C2 or the dens, um, but just be very wary and, and talk to your, communication is everything with your clinicians. And there's a different type. I don't know this. I'd have to go. I don't see this that often, so I won't focus on this. Now you can say this person had atlanoaxial instability where they tried to wire C1 and C2 together. You can see that there's a widening of this joint space. So they tried to, they probably had a rotatory subluxation or some transverse ligament injury. So they've tried to wire the, the posterior arches together, which isn't really doing very much. Now the next level is the C2 and the C2, C3 joint. And again, the osseous only fractures, those dense type fractures or lamina, or whether there's a ligamentous injury or whether there's starting to be translation. And here's just the different examples. You can see that type one is just the tip of the dens. Type two goes through the base. This is the most scary one because this, you're holding on to the transverse ligament is sort of right here, 
but the the C2 body is uh, mobile. At least there's a little bit of, on the type three, there's a little piece of bone uh, holding on for dear life, but these also can be, I've seen these also shift over time. Now, things that I have seen people call like dense fractures, which aren't, which are mimics, are the os odontoidium, which is like a secondary ossification center. This should like form together, but it never fused together. So that's an os odontoidium. And this is called a osiculum terminale, where it's, I see this all the time, just a little bit of degenerative changes where sort of that apical ligament is. It's this little, little ossification right here. Make sure not to call these dense fractures is basically what I'm saying. Okay, now there's the hangman fracture where it's a posterior, uh, the, lamp, the pedicle of C2 um, osseous. Now this, this case scares me a little bit because I would have called this CT sort of normal and to prove otherwise, like proven otherwise. But when we get the MRI, one of the telltale findings that there's actually a ligamentous injury is a prevertebral effusion. So if you can pick up on the CT and get an MRI, you might um, save a couple of people. You can see this anterior longitudinal ligament comes down. It's all along those vertebral bodies like we talked about, but there's a little defect here. That's probably just a little string. So it's injured. It's not completely disrupted. It looks like it's hanging on for dear life. And you get all of this posterior sort of paraspinal and uh, ligamentous injury back here, supraspinous. And then there's also a little bit more fluid in that uh, facet joint space, all indicating that um, it could be maybe a whiplash injury. It's pulled back or uh, we'll see. I don't know what, what caused this person's injury, but there's some injuries in the ligaments and facets. Now, this is an example of an extension teardrop fracture. Um, this is when the head gets whipped back. And you can see, again, you want to pick up on this prevertebral uh, effusion. But this is basically the ALL coming here and ripping off that anterior inferior corner of C2. And that's a classic location for it. You can see it at other locations happen, but this is classic for extension teardrop. These aren't as bad as the flexion teardrop fractures. Um, and I think we'll show you a case later on today. I don't have an MRI for that one. And then again, type C, examples of type C injuries. You can see that there's distraction between C2 and C3 here, or, or there's been anterior subluxation of C2 on C3. So this would indicate a type C level injury. So that's all those cranial cervical junction, upper cervical spine um, categories. Now, when we start talking about the subaxial, they sort of start with the worst with C and then move down to the ligament and then just the, benign, the osseous fractures. And I'll show you some examples of that. So type C would be a CT where we have, you can see there's clearly anterior subluxation of this vertebral body. You can see the disc is sort of floating in and of itself, but this thing is pressing on the cord. Thankfully, I don't think that's real cord signal, but you can see all of this ligamentous injury be, um, interspinous injury, maybe supraspinous ligament. You have your nuchal ligament coming down here. Everything looks abnormal, but this is a very unstable spine. Now we have posterior tension band. And you know, this is very rare to just have an osseous, a bony only sort of tension band injury. This would be like a clay shovelers or something like that going through the spinous process and not having that much um, ligamentous damage. So these are very rare. Normally what you're going to get is you're going to get this type of pathology where it's a, a lig an anterior flexion injury and you tear all of the posterior ligaments and you crush the anterior vertebral body. This is an example of that where you can see that there's abnormal marrow signal in the anterior inferior aspect of this vertebral body. And you can have in the interspinous space, those, uh, those ligaments are, are damaged. Now, I'm not gonna see like retraction of the interspinous ligaments, but this is indicating that when you start seeing on these flare or, or fat saturated or stir weighted sequences, some uh, abnormal signal and also along the supraspinous ligaments, uh, this is indicating a flexion type pathology. And then there's the anterior band. It's almost like that C2 uh, extension teardrop, but instead of there, it involves here. So this is clearly uh, a, a, an a sort of extension type injury here. And you'd want to look at the cord and uh, look for any herniated disc and thing like that. Now this one also gives me some nightmares at night because the only thing that's um, showing up here, it, it's a little bit subluxed. And this is the type of subluxation that we're looking for, especially when you start seeing, and I didn't show you a soft tissue window, but there's an effusion right here. You can see that on the MRI, the effusion. On this, you can see that there's increased signal in the disc. And that's when you start cause, calling some 
quote traumatic disc, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, chord signal abnormality, there's um, this chords damage and all this sort of everything's jumbled together here. All these ligaments have abnormal signal, supraspinous, intraspinous region, uh, paraspinal muscles. So it's very subtle. And this is what I want my residents to pick up on. Again, here's another tension band injury where the ALL is completely disrupted. You have a little bit of a uh, disc that's herniated, probably acute disc. And there's probably some epidural blood products there as well. And we'll talk about some epidural blood products uh, later on. The ligamentum flavum is kind of buckled here, um, but it looks grossly intact. And then you have your, non, your minor non-structural fractures, just like your, your clay shoveler's fracture, things like that. Um, you have, and this, we're gonna talk about compression fractures because all my residents just call everything a, a compression fracture, but this classification system sort of gives a more descriptive term towards these. And if there's nothing you remember from my lecture today, it's trying to make sure you're describing these compression fractures right. So when we talk about wedge, it's just sort of one end plate, uh, either usually it's superior and then anterior. So it's just a wedge. Uh, here's two wedge compression fractures. There's probably one there too. But, and then there's a split type fracture where I, I don't know if it's just because of a flexion injury, it just it hits both end plates, but it doesn't go through the anterior cortex. And then there's the incomplete burst. And this is where you can start being a little bit more descriptive where it goes front to back, but it doesn't go through the inferior end plate. It's just one end, uh, superior end plate usually. These will have more of just what I call bowing as opposed to retropulsion. If you, it used to be when I was in a resident um, that if you called retropulsion, they couldn't get uh, kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. I don't know if that's still the case, but um, that's why I'm very careful with, this is just a little bit of bowing as opposed to the complete burst, which goes top, bottom, back to forth. This is just things that are evulsed. Um, this is clearly retropulse and that's more often with a complete burst, you get retropulsion. And then here's just another example. You can see sometimes in the coronal plane, these fractures, but it goes, so that tells you it's top bottom. And then you can see the fracture going to the back. So again, this is an MRI, but you have to use in MRI imaging, use your CTs first, okay? And just some more um, thing going on to the next section, the thoracolumbar. lumbar, it's the same sort of setup where you start with the worst, whether there's translation, look at for ligaments and then just look for osseous lesions. Now, when you're talking about displacement or distraction, it's either like a sloughing off to one side anteriorly, uh, sort of a torn away or a pull a distracted type injury. This is probably from a, uh, they probably were wearing their seatbelt and it's holding the bottom, like something happened where you can see this distraction between the vertebral bodies and um, it's subluxed and this there's probably a cord damage here. But um, this is another uh, example of somebody that probably had a flexion injury. They compressed probably anterior wedge compression of their um, vertebral body here. And you can see that disruption of that dark cortex is what you're looking for. You have some marrow edema. The posterior wall and the inferior wall look okay, but it's sort of like a wedge compression. But that's just cause subluxation because You've had ligamentum flavum damage. You have interspinous ligament, sort of there's disconnection of this uh, superior, um, uh, the supraspinous ligament, just all of this cause subluxation and all the cotta nerve roots are causing sort of critical spinal canal stenosis there. Again, here's another sort of horrible fracture where the vertebra body exploded and you it, see how hard it's, you can see that. For, I think this is part of the vertebral body right here and there's these osseous fragments, but you can see that ALL has been torn away from the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. Uh, you might have a little slip still together, but PLL is destroyed. Ligamentum flavum, I don't even know where it is anymore. And if I were to go laterally, I bet although there's a facet capsular injury. Now, this is what in a type B situation, what we would call a chance, like technically a chance fracture is how they categorize it, where the fracture goes through the osseous structures only. I know we all call chance fractures if it just goes from front to back, but this is how they sort of classify it. You have this, I think it's all going all the way across and it's going, it's sort of splaying that um, spinous process. So it goes all the way across, but it's mostly in the bone. 
these look symmetric in the interspinous space here. So maybe these are intact and this is just through the bone, but this is technically what a chance fracture should be. Um, this is an example of something that my, my fellow missed his last day uh, with me at Grady a couple years ago. Uh, you can see that he kept on looking at this. He's like, oh, is this some weird limbus vertebral body? I mean, it doesn't look too bad. He couldn't find any edema. I think it was this one or the, I can't remember. There's not a lot of edema in it, but he missed this ligamentous injury here. You can see the ALL, the, I mean, sorry, ligamentum flavum is disrupted or an abnormal and there's abnormal signal in the interspinous space. This was a flexion type injury. For some reason, he just missed this. I was <laughs> like, dude, come on. So again, osseous injury, but we do MRI to uh, look for edema, which failed us in this situation, but um, uh, looking for this te posterior tension band type disruption. Um, this is another example of that sort of anterior like flexion type injury with posterior tension band. You can see the vertebral body is collapsed. You see discontinuity, the black line, a lot of edema in there. ALL is probably torn. Uh, ligamentum flavum is torn, interspinous ligaments are torn, and probably supraspinous. So again, it, it involves more of the ligaments than the bony structure. Of, I mean, I'm sure the um, spinous process is also fractured in this, but that's what you're looking for. And then this is a hyperextension injury. Now this person like severely, they've had vertebral plasties before and they're um, severely bone demineralized. But you can see when you start seeing distract, like a fracture with like, it's distracting from each other. Uh, this person I think did like that's, they fell on their back onto something and they did sort of like that's, or you can get younger people doing the, the scorpion where their legs, they land on their face and their legs wrap around their head. That's the type of injury that your uh, history that you're looking for with these. All right, and then there's, again, the non-structural stuff like the spinous process, the transverse process of fractures, just some more things. Now, when you're looking for transverse process fractures on CT, I find like coronal is very helpful, especially in the cervical spine. So make sure not to um, not look at those, um, those um, reformats. Here's another example of a pincher type fracture. It mostly goes through the center and doesn't involve that anterior, um, um, aspect of the vertebral body. And then again, if you don't remember everything, just make sure you're categorizing, not just calling everything a compression fracture, whether it's a wedge, whether it's an incomplete burst or a complete burst. And they can be heard sometimes. Like this is an example, I think of a wedge compression fracture um, right here. Maybe there's another one up here, or maybe I can't tell if this dark dense line goes all the way back to call it an incomplete burst. It can be hard sometimes. Here's another example where I think it's kind of wedgy here, but does that sclerotic line go all the way uh, across? It's hard. Um, again, just some more examples of incomplete burst versus wedges. Again, there's not a lot of retropulsion. There might be a little bit bowing of that superior end plate, but um, yeah, the, just I want my residents to be a little bit more descriptive about it. Okay, and just more. So. Now, here's an example of a complete burst in the lumbar spine. You can see it goes top bottom and I think it goes back to front. You can see all of the edema here, the disruption of that dark cortical bands in multiple locations it goes all the way down. Here's a little cool. defect right here. But um, yeah, this is a, what a complete burst is. And you can see that there's either been retropulsion of osseous fragments or disc material. Or there's some nugget here pushing on that PLL right there. Now, sometimes I feel like I'm, you have to look at a lot of these and sometimes you're gonna get a lot of difference of opinion. Like, is this ligament like intact? Is it just displaced? Like you're looking for abnormal signal um, in the ligament, the dark ligament itself. Um, and it can get hard once you have like um, anterior osteophytes that cause some ligament sort of edema or edema around the ligament. Um, but it's something you wanna, um, if you see complete disruption of it, maybe there is disruption right there of it. So it's hard. You just have to look at a lot of them and give your best uh, guess of it. But if you categorize it into A, B, and C, I think that really um, helps. Now let's talk real quickly about um, some other type injuries. Some of the modifiers for that uh, AO classification have to deal with facets. So here is an example. You can see that there's anterior subluxation of this um, 
cervical spine here and widening back here. That should be classic sort of it, it, uh, thought process that there's a ligamentous injury and facet injury here. And as you go out further um, laterally, you can see that the inferior facet of this vertebral body is perched on top of that, okay? And that's caused some anterior lithesis. You don't need an MRI to tell me that this facet capsule is injured. And that's just one thing to, to talk about is um, when we start talking about facet capsular injury, some people don't believe in that. But I, I mean, Dr. Singer has uh, shown me a case where we sort of missed a facet capsular injury. They went home. I don't know if they took off their uh, C collar, but they, they went from normal position to a jumped facet at home because uh, we didn't really pick up that the facet capsule, capsule was injured at those levels. So I am a huge uh, fan of trying to find these uh, facet capsular injuries and I'll show you some examples. Here's an example of like having a facet fracture, which is also a modifier in this uh, AO classification. You always, for my residents, you always want your, if you have a, a facet uh, jumped or perched facet, you want your uh, facets to be fractured um, because usually if they aren't and they're just perched, you have a higher chance of having a spinal cord injury uh, just because of the distraction, distraction and uh, process of that. So um, that's the classic thing. If you don't see a fracture, there's a higher chance of having a um, cord injury. And here's another example of, you can see that there's a fr facet fracture or a lamina uh, fracture going into the facets, but this facet widening, it's one of the hardest things for um, residents to pick up on if you're going too fast. You can see the normal sort of caliber of this, but this is sort of widening a little bit. That should indicate to you that there's a ligament or a facet capsular injury as well. Um, Again, just some more examples of jumped facets. So you can see it's gone all the way over the other side of the facet. So that's jumped. When you're looking at MRI, <clears throat> this is a case where there was significant translation. Um, the ALL might be a little bit, there's a little bit of signal there. Maybe it's a little bit of um, damage, but it's still intact. PLL is the same thing, but you can see ligamentum, uh, the flavum is, is disrupted interspinous ligament, all these supraspinous ligaments are disrupted. But when you're going out laterally, what you're looking for is sort of increased signal around that facet capsule right there. Again, there was some increased signal up here around these facets, indicating that um, I, there was an anterior um, corner fracture here, um, that there is a facet capsular injury as well. <clears throat> Moving on to traumatic discs. Um, this is something that I was told never to sort of say in, in real life because you'll, in dip depositions, they'll, they'll ask you, how do you know that's traumatized disc? How do you know that's not a degenerative disc? And they'll just grill you about it. But um, what you wanna sort of talk about is <clears throat> if there's disc extrusion or anything with some increased disc signal, which may represent acute injury is sort of how you might wanna word it. But here are three different examples of a quote traumatic disc you always have to have some T2 signal in it, okay? Here's that flexion injury um, where, you, where you have that anterior corner here. It's a little bit of disc edema there. Again, here, it's starting to extrude out anteriorly. Again, some disc edema. Here's an example of a, disc, a large disc extrusion anteriorly. The, the thing is, is sometimes these will uh, protrude or extrude posteriorly and cause cord compression and damage. And so that's why you got to watch out for it. And then the hardest thing I think for residents, fellows, attendings to pick up on is epidural hematomas. And the, they're really hard. So the, the signal can be variable depending on the age of the blood products. But things I want uh, people to look for is is there a dirty T1? Does it look different from the CSF that's around it that you know, like you can see surrounding the uh, cerebellum? Um, is there any heterogeneous signal, like weird sort of swirling or anything like that? What can happen is like this, the epidural hematomas can look like CSF on T2. And every I, I was taught that it should be dark because it has blood products and stuff like that. And that's not always the case. Uh, the times that I've seen it, the worst is when the entire cord is, uh, you have this circumferential epidural hematoma and it looks just like CF, CSF. Um, so the things that I want you to pay attention to when you're looking for these epidural hematomas and trauma, 
is how does it distort the dural or fecal sac? And then uh, if it displaces the spinal cord. Here's some examples, this is a CT. And you can see on the CT, sometimes it's, you can, it's hyper dense. So there's some stuff here and there's some stuff here. And there's also some stuff here. You can see that this is the fecal sac. You can see it anterior and posteriorly. Now, that being said, when we're talking about traumatic disc, is how do I know this is not a traumatic disc on the axial? And it's hard to tell sometimes. And that's why the one thing is, is you have to sort of make sure you look on the sagittal views of the cervical spine on a soft tissue window, because I can't tell you the number of times I've seen a large disc extrusion causing severe spinal canal stenosis, just like sticking out that way, because the resident just looked at the, the bone windows on the sagittal views looking for trauma. Um, so make sure you always look at your sagittal views in the, um, in the sagittal plane on soft tissue windows, okay? But this is an example of a large epidural hematoma. And here's the MRI for it. <clears throat> I wish all of the epidural hematomas like this, you can see clearly the CSF at the skull base. And you can see it sort of attenuates and there's heterogeneous signal here displacing the cord and um, causing the, the cord. So this is clear right here. But did you see also that this is probably on this fluid sensitive sequence, this is probably also um, an epidural hematoma uh, or a CSF leak or something, but usually an epidural hematoma, you can see that here's the dural, I'm sorry for this line, I don't know why it came through like this, but the dura is right here. There's something eccentric on this one side, pushing it flat so it's a little bit asymmetric from the other side. This is probably epidural blood products, both ventrally and dorsally going all the way down. And this is probably a little bit of CSF. If you start seeing the dura between two different CSF sort of signals, I want you to think that there's something in the uh, epidural space. Here's another example. Um, you can see again that this is that dirty CSF. You can see how CSF should look and it's a little bit brighter here and here um, on, the C on the T1 weighted sequence. It's hard to see, I feel like sometimes on the T1 weighted sequence, but you see dirty CSF, you see CSF signal and then spinal cord. That should tell you that there's something going on here, okay? And again, this had significant injury, I mean, the uh, dura has sort of been pulled off of that anterior arch of C1 on multiple levels. And there's just something in this space right here. You can see that the CSF gets funneled. It's like right here. And then you completely lose that um, CSF space. And this is what you're looking for. This is a horrible MRI. He moved around a lot. Um, it was on probably our oldest MRI scanner, but you can clearly see the, the fecal sac here you can see there's multiple areas where it's displaced. You can also see it's supposed to be, you lose that, the, there's supposed to be tacked down right here, the curtain sign, it should look like this. There's something displacing everything anteriorly. So when you're scrolling down on the axials, and I find that you can find it on the axials a lot easier than you can on the sagittals, is to look for something that's pushing on uh, that dural, that uh, the fecal sac there, okay? Um, sometimes it's hard um, to tell fat epidural lipomatosis or fat from epidural hematomas. And that's why you want to sort of look on your fat saturated sequences if you have them. Okay, uh, we're doing well. We're going to be ahead of time here, but we're going to talk about some vascular injuries. Um, now, wherever you are, just make sure that you're paying attention to those, especially the vertebral arteries, but the blood vessels uh, on MRI. Um, you, you should at your institution have sort of criteria at least um, on when to do vascular imaging or when to look for blunt cerebral vascular injury, whether it's things that are clinical up front or whether it's things that you're going to find on your dry or your non-contrasted uh, CT imaging. But just make sure you you're using some form of um, indication or um, a process. So usually you start with the non-cons of the neck and then you'll do it. You already have a CTA of the neck um, fitting those clinical or imaging criteria, but MRI can be very helpful in identifying um, dissections or uh, other uh, vascular imaging. So our dissection protocol includes an axial T1 weighted fat saturated images through the neck. And what you're looking for is crescentic sort of a, a eccentric uh, intramural hematomas. Now, what I learned in the last couple of months, which I never learned before for some reason, um, 
was that that dissection will only be bright, which we classically sort of test on be, uh, after four to seven days. I said uh, three to seven days and um, two months. So in that subacute time period, and it will be ISO intense after like either before, like in the acute phase, which are most of our traumas or um, it, after two months. So remember it not having signal doesn't mean it's not a dissection and that's um, in that acute hyperacute uh, phase. What you're also gonna look for is for a loss of the flow void on the T2 axial images. And what I will say is like, you know, sometimes people come in with like, I'm having neck pain and they don't have any quote history of trauma, but you'll find dissections. Remember dissections hurt really bad uh, or they should hurt. And so make sure when you're doing just your routine um, workup for radiculopathy or spinal canal stenosis that you're looking uh, at those T2 uh, axial sequences to make sure those flow voids are normal. Um, so with blunt cerebral vascular injury, the, if you see them or on the CTA, you're gonna, it's gonna require follow-up in seven to 10 days. Um, all injuries are, pe people are started on aspirin unless um, they uh, have like some bleeding risk like intracranial hemorrhage. Um, majority of these injuries either resolve or remain unchanged. And I taught a resident the other, that the other day and we opened it up and it had gone from a Denver two to a Denver three injury. So it's put my foot in my mouth, but, um, but a small subset will progress. Um, but just keep that in mind that you will get follow-up imaging um, if, you, if you find these vascular images. Now, if you don't know, you should be following the Denver or Biffle grade scale. Remember, Denver criteria is different than like a Denver grading. So grade one, they're simply just less than 25% luminal narrowing. I call these the voodoo sort of vascular energy because a lot of people have uh, atherosclerosis. Some people just overcall it. So th this can be really hard. These usually don't are incidental and don't need any real... Um, intervention besides some aspirin. The grade two is when you start getting a raised intimal flap. So if you see a, a, a dissection flap or um, a dissection on your MRI imaging causing more than 25% stenosis, if you see like a free, a free fl floating thrombi or something that's causing a insignificant dural AV fistula, which I've never seen in real life, um, cause that. So then you get up to the grade three, which is a pseudoaneurysm, a grade four, which is occlusion, which we see those quite uh, often, but then the Denver five, uh, which is a transection or extravasation. And I've only seen one or two of them and I'll show you that case from earlier, but just a Denver one injury. So sometimes it's difficult to, like I said, differentiate from athro. Um, they're usually just gonna need some um, aspirin. But one thing I want you to pay attention to is if you're scrolling, if you say you're looking at an MRI or you're out looking at a CTA and they've had sp spine injury, your ICA should be symmetric. Your internal carotid arteries should be symmetric going up. And let, the only time that that's sort of uh, okay is if you have an absent A1 segment on the same side where the smaller side of the ICA. Um, if you have asymmetric ICA and there's no absent A1, I want you going back and looking a second time to make sure that you're not missing a, uh, vas a blunt cerebrovascular injury doing that dissection protocol MRI uh, with uh, T1 weighted uh, fat saturated images. And I'll show you an example of that. Here's an example of that Denver grade two injury. See that, that classic googly eye appearance with the eccentric um, um, dissection and it's narrowed the carotid artery a little bit. Remember in that subacute phase, it will be bright, but if you see something and it's not um, it's either hyperacute, depending on the clinical time frame, or it's something chronic. Okay, and it should narrow the lumen by a, uh, greater than 25%. Okay, this is one of those T1 fat saturated images, and this is exactly what we're looking for. This is a Denver three injury. Um, this is a large pseudoaneurysm. It's a contained rupture. Remember, sometimes these are so subtle because people have hypertension and the vessels can be very tortuous. So make sure you're using reformats in order to look at the tortuosity of these vessels to make sure it's not a, uh, there isn't a dilation in that vessel. Um, it can be associated with an intimal flap, like a dissection. So uh, we ca I call those dissecting pseudoaneurysms as well. 
And remember, it, when you're looking at these CTAs or on these uh, MRAs, if you're looking for a dissection, is making sure uh, to look at that first centimeter below the carotid canal, right at the skull base. This is usually where that vascular inj injury is, okay? This is a grade four. You can see that there's no flow in that left vertebral artery from, I think there was a fracture here. You can see that this is that one of those uh, T1 fat saturated images. You can see there's no, it looks very abnormal. There's something circumferential, but you're also gonna look for the absence of flow void on the T2 weighted sequences. And then finally, this, this Denver 5 injury, I mean, this is the most, um, it was an inter, a supraclinoid segment that was extravasating into the head. As you can see, there's nothing else going in the head. So they had significant um, uh, intracranial pressure, which outweighed the uh, perfusion pressure. So there was no uh, contrast getting into the head besides extravasating in the subarachnoid space down into the spinal canal and out into that torn um, prevertebral space. So, so we are done. Um, it was a whirlwind of different um, examples of spine injury, but uh, it helps to really, uh, I tell my residents, just go back and look at all the MRI trauma spines and just look to see if you can see any of these structures. If you don't see them, it doesn't mean like, if you don't see an apical ligament, it doesn't mean that it's damaged if like your ALL, PLL, and your uh, anterior lenoocipital membrane are all intact. It's probably not damaged. You just can't see it. Um, so don't make that um, uh, fall into that pitfall. Okay. Always look at your CT before your MRI. Use your stir or your fat saturated sequences or those thin T2 section to look for those ligaments to identify any disruption of the ligaments. And then try to categorize into that AO classification system. So with that, um, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to contact me. You can also scan the, um, the other QR code here. But uh, yeah, I do it like Dr. Singer said, I do a case every week unless it's Christmas and then um, uh, just for education purposes. So thank you again for having me. I hopefully uh, will help you in the future. Thank you, Ryan. That was a, a fantastic talk. Um, really appreciate it. We did have a couple questions come in. Um, the first was about uh, subdural hemorrhage, um, how you yeah. go about identifying them, if you have any suggestions, and, and then differentiating between other types of hemorrhage. You know, it's, it's subdural hemorrhage is very hard. Um, again, um, I'm not that good at it. Um, it's, you're supposed to be able to see displacement of uh, different parts of that um, anteriorly and posteriorly, I, I'm, I'm not good at it. So no, it's, I don't have any good tips on picking up that um, type of process, unless I could see that there's uh, different layers and stuff like that. I'm sure there's something in the literature that can help you, but yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Awesome. Um, second question was about the Denver ones and you know you sort of touched on it. But any tips or suggestions on how to differentiate, um, you know, just atherosclerotic uh, narrowing? Versus well, I mean, if if you see a fracture at the level where it's irregular, then you have to sort of go with the Denver one. If it's like there's no trauma adjacent to it, um, and they're an older patient, you might want to err on this is likely atherosclerotic disease, um, especially if you see calcifications on the CT or if they had bad athero elsewhere. I might lean more towards that. But again, if you have uh, a regular irregularity right at where the clearly where the fractures like going through the transversalis foramen for those vertebral arteries uh, you really want to uh, just use your other sort of like the age other athro elsewhere and whether it's adjacent to where that fracture is you have to err on the side of like yeah this might be a denver one awesome all right. Well, those are the couple questions that rolled in. So I think that was it. It was a very comprehensive talk. So I think you answered a lot of people's questions. So. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. It was, it was a pleasure and uh, thank you for doing it. All right. Well, thank you so much. Fantastic. We'll upload later today. Um, and to everyone else, uh, thanks for watching and stay safe.